I mean, it's it's a pleasure to talk here and actually see a number of friends uh, listening. So, um, you know, it's, it's actually interesting. I saw Chris there. I saw Chris on the on the um, on the um, symposium, and um, you know, Chris Tate. I think I think when I give a talk on this, and it's been a while since I gave a methods talk, but it's a good chance that Chris is also giving a talk in the same symposium. So that's fun, even if it's it's by Zoom here. Um, and um, so what I'm going to talk about is sort of the, the approaches that our lab has been using over a number of years to go about, um, you know, understanding structural details of, of uh, SLC transporters. Um, and for those who didn't know, the, the human membrane proteome um, has around 400 or so. So after GPCRs, they represent the second largest fraction of the membrane proteome. They haven't been so much targeted as drug targets, so they're um, that's changing, there's been interest from pharma for that, uh, but of course they're responsible for um, transporting metabolites, ions, and drugs across the membranes, they're very important to cell homeostasis. Uh, and some of them, of course, are, are known drug targets already. So our interest in is, is to understand the structure of these guys, so we can better understand their role in human physiology, how do they work, should maybe us an idea of how they go about the function and where they do it. Um, so our, our interests in the lab have really focused uh, on two main types of transporters, sugar transporters, those for monosaccharides, such as uh, glucose, those are glute transporters, and those that involve the maintaining pH, homeostasis, and sodium levels, sodium protein exchanges. And of course, those two systems are fundamental uh, for cell homeostasis. Um, so, you know, when you want to think about developing a mechanism using structures to understand that, of course, uh, we have to appreciate what we're trying to do. And to understand how something works, we obviously gonna need multiple confirmations. And what we're trying to do is to understand a picture of the so-called alternating axis cycle. And this shows you uh, that they can come in three different flavors of how you might move a substrate across the membrane. It's not really necessary for this talk, but it's to, just for us to remember that, you know, a structure by itself is just one snapshot and obviously multiple confirmations to really understand how something's working. Um, so, you know, we're gonna to need to combine that structural information uh, with assays, with kinetics, uh, binding. Uh, we need something in a relevant confirmation, you know, we think working detergent, obviously stuff work in the membrane. Uh, things are naturally dynamic. Even with, you know, Kyrian, we might get states, we understand how those states are connected. Uh, to do all that, we really first need to obviously work with the protein. Uh, so, so, you know, so obviously being able to produce the protein, uh, in fact, I would say with Karyem, we're, we're interested in more and more challenging targets. Uh, so things that we may not even consider before because it's difficult to get, you know, yields that are sufficient enough and uh, maybe stability is an issue. Now, of course, uh, you know, we made things so stable because we work in mild detergents and get structural information. And so things are definitely changing and requirements are definitely changing as well. But the bear in mind, you know, to build up a model, we need multiple confirmation states and understand how they're connected. Um, so um, the approach that, that we took when I was a PhD student, um, and I think I presented this for the first time in meeting in Switzerland in 2000, I think I definitely remember presenting that poster to Chris. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's, uh, and so it goes a while back, but the idea at the time was that Jeffrey Waldo had tagged things to GFP and shown that you could use GFP as a folding indicator for globular proteins. Um, and we thought, could this work for membrane proteins? Um, it turns out GFP is not as good folding for globular proteins because globular proteins fold, uh, fold, fold, um, multi fold, fold, fold um, uh, um, I mean, two proteins will fold co-instantaneously if you like, uh, whereas a membrane proteins with co-translational folding, of course, if you have the GFP at the C-terminus, the membrane protein first has to integrate to membrane before the GFP uh, can express me folded. Um, so then, you know, we could show that you could use the readout for the fluorescence to give you an idea of how much protein was being expressed, at least how much ended up in the membrane versus inclusion bias in the coli. Um, and of course, uh, the nice thing about GFP, uh, you know, that is that you can also detect it on SDS gels, so it's very stable. Um, and so we don't need to use Western blotting, which is also an advantage, of course, um, having good antibodies against membrane proteins. And um, of course, you know, it's a little bit simpler, um, but I guess the, the sort of the, the, the bit that really sort of made sort of GFP tagging more widely used, of course, was this fluorescent size exclusion chromatography that Eric's lab set up. 
Essentially, you can take your solubilized fusion now before it's purified, run it inside the student column and see what it looks like. So you might want to test the detergents, but of course, now you can look at different homologues or different constructs. And of course, the bit to remember, and this is a bit that some people forget, is just because something's in a membrane doesn't mean it's, it's well folded, right? So obviously you're looking for things that look like they will be folded, but they still not functional. So and the GFP tail gives us read out stuff that gets into a membrane. It won't really tell us about the quality of the, of the protein that's, that's there. But even that is very useful. Uh, and, and we've been working with um, pipelines and E. coli and Saccharomyces. And the idea basically is you can think of the GFP is is we still can't predict what proteins will be able to be expressed, right? So uh, we need something that's going to enable us to go through this process uh, as, as fast as possible. And that allows us to get information that's useful that we can go back and, and uh, redesign a system, redesign a construct. Um, so with that in mind, uh, in fact, this was the reason we went with Saccharomyces, although at the time PICI was quite important, was that Saccharomyces does one thing really well, uh, and that's homology recombination, which means we can just synthesize a gene uh, and we can add it to a linearized vector and Saccharomyces will happily recombine uh, our, our, you know, our, our linear uh, DNA fragment with a vector and, and the cloning becomes trivial. Um, and so that's a real advantage because, uh, you, know, you know, within uh, two days, uh, in fact, we typically order gene strings for life technologies, linear DNA fragments. Uh, and they'll come and we, you know, you could order 20 clones, they come in the tube, you can actually um, add water to those overnight and then directly transform those uh, and, you, you know, you get colonies in a couple of days. Um, and so, and so this, this was, the, re the idea was to have this fast system where we could quickly look at uh, expression and then we thought we'd then would go to pick here, uh, but it turns out that most cases we get enough material to work with, so we actually end up sticking with Saccharomyces. And so we have a, our GFP tag, it has an 8S tag. I was interested to see that the 8S tag was quite popular. Uh, I, I think I, I made an 8S tag in E. coli because I failed to get the 9S uh, and I gave up on cloning. Uh, but it's interesting to see how the 8S then sort of became more popular, but it, it, there was no logic actually behind the 8S tag. Uh, but in any case, um, um, this is our vector we use uh, and we have a cleavable site. We use TIV, but of course you use precision or, or whatever. Um, and so um, <clears throat> what we typically do is if you have many uh, constructs, uh, and, and you, you know, as you say, we can quickly transform, uh, but these have quite a tough cell wall. So we need to add some sort of glass beads, break the, break the um, cell debris, spin them down. And actually you can just spin down the supernatant on a, even a normal desktop centrifuge. It's enough to isolate membranes that we can solubilize uh, in a gel and, and do some SG, SG, SGS page and, and gel fluorescence. And so when we did that, uh, this was now um, when I was a postdoc with uh, uh, so, so Water, I managed to convince Simon Newstead to join me on this, uh, working with eukaryotic membrane proteins. And actually it worked fairly well. Um, and we managed to express actually quite a number of drug transporters. I can't remember exactly the ones that are here. Um, um, but uh, you know, it, it works surprisingly well enough for us to be able to, you know, when we're just taking a selection of SLC tr transporters, number of homologues, uh, enough that we'd find few that to work with um, in that case. Um, and some of the control experiments uh, we did was to check that, you know, if you, you know, you're taking um, 10 mils of a culture, when you scaled up to fermenter, would you get similar yields? And you did, uh, you know, if you're taking whole cell counts and then you isolate uh, uh, membranes are here, do you get roughly the same amount of membranes? And you see there's a pretty good correlation. So we I mean, could take a whole cell estimate and then roughly estimate what that meant in terms of membranes. Um, one sort of technical point, uh, which may be interesting to some people, I don't know, uh, is we always wondered what didn't spin down, right? So you do, you do your ultra centrifugation step, uh, we use a TI-45 rotor, um, and, you know, but it was interested in the stuff that is still fluorescent in the supernatant, and does that free GFP? But actually, if you're running a gel quite often, it's actually still fusion. So I think it's actually vesicles that are just too small uh, to spin down. So if you spun longer or use a TI-70 rotor, you might be able to isolate slightly more material. In any case, there's a little bit of loss there, uh, but, um, 
this is our approach and this is an example of just what this uh, what this means and so this is this is lack y um, purification this is uh, you know what you might get some solid membranes if it's well expressed protein like y you flow through what's binding nickel column uh, and your elution and then the end gel fluorescence you can you know you can might be able to pick out my finger and there's a camera there in the natural light I'm just taking a picture of this in your fluorescence, obviously, you can see it was really concentrated. The GFP is there, uh, and that's this is very simple, of course. Uh, of course, with the blue light, you can go to lower detection limits, uh, and this is our, our recovered protein, which is fine for crystallization, etc. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> we you know use that pipeline, uh, um, and we're interested in this case. We started working on glucose transporters. Won't go into to much um, detail about those. Obviously, they're very important to genome-wide um, um, malian uh, blood glucose homeostasis. Um, and so, they're one of the systems we're testing in yeast, um, and we could, you know, get nicely uh, well-expressed protein. Uh, we see, you know, here uh, you might get a bit of free GFP. That's quite normal, and, and it's it's typically protein that's been degraded. But the GFP is still stable, uh, but something like this we wouldn't be worried with because the main protein peak is monosperse, uh, and then we have a his tag, and we'd go through purification, cleave off the GFP, uh, and, and go through, past the reverse column. We end up with the um, purified common of protein. In this case, we could compare its uh, its its transport of the glucose and its its binding inhibitors. Uh, and it was similar to the same protein in this case that could be produced from red blood cells. Uh, and this was work with uh, Michiro Kazuhara, which actually did the original reconstitution of these of, of these transports in the 1970s. And it was as good as material that he had worked with. I uh, there's nice confidence that at least for the GLUT transport, this, this, this system was working well. Um, and so we ended up that we can actually express a number of GLUT transporters uh, in, 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 in Saccharomyces and to, in, in things like, you know, GLUT4 doesn't express as well in GLUT2 and some express better or worse, but, you know, we, we screen a number, uh, not an extensive, I would say, maybe a little bit more than this, but, you know, maybe uh, two or three times more than this, but just sort of at that time, CDNA, we could get, get a hold of uh, and see how it went. Um, and so, what we ended up working with actually uh, was, I can't even quite remember how we decided to work in GLUT5. I think, you know, it wasn't one of the best expressed, but maybe we tried a few and this one ended up giving some crystals. Um, just to note that the wild, that the wild type protein has a single N glycosylation site, but removal of that glycan site was quite unusual. Mutant was based on previous literature. I think we sort of made it mutant, but it was well folded and, you know, it, it didn't, seem to change in terms of functional activity. Uh, but this this is, and this is what most people realize with crystallization, obviously, we are from crystals that are poorly diffracting crystals at the time. Uh, and we could add lipids and we could prove the stability, but we got stuck at this, you know, this five Armstrongs, which is obviously very typical for, for this sort of project. Um, and so this is, this is um, you know, this is when I was finishing up the postdoc, so trying to um, if you like, um, tabulate where have we had got to and what other people are doing. We were screening a number of SLC transporters mainly. And, and basically, you know, if, if we were just interested in things that were, you know, monsperse and that we could express neither yeast or coli and we could purify in DDM, um, you know, it wasn't too bad in terms of getting crystals, right? We, we you know, obviously, you know, we're, we know what we're doing a little bit <laughs> and then we're making mutate, but it wasn't like this was the hurdle. Of course, the hurdle is getting something that's crystallized for actually solving its structure. So, you know, um, what did we need to do to improve the crystals that we were getting? Um, and, um, and so the, the question came, of course, and this is really work um, beheaded by Chris looking at uh, GPCRs was actually how thermostable do these transporters need to be? Uh, if we want to get them in, in some other detergent, uh, what do we need? What do we need? Basically, was the question we had. Um, uh, and so, you know, at that time, and, and this is a number of years ago, but maybe it's still, I think, it's still important, and relevant to think about, especially if you want to be in crystallization, what things you need, what requirements you need. And certainly, if you look at the at the data at the time, the short similar 
you know, that things in my smaller mice cell detergents tended to go to high resolution, of course, because uh, the smaller the mice cell, the more protein packing uh, they can get, the, small, the, the lower the solvent content, the better the crystals can diffract. Obviously, the point is to work out, you know, how, how stable do you need something can, to get them in those small micelle detergents? And, and Chris will be talking tomorrow, I think, about getting whipping GPCRs into shape, essentially where we want, you know, confirmationally stabilized proteins uh, that are you know, obviously more thermostable detergents, so we can get them in those small micelle detergents uh, so they're going to diffract well, and he can tell, tell you about that tomorrow. Um, but at the time, we were just interested in something that we could sort of do and quite easily do. And we had, so we ended up using the, this um, CPM assay, which, you know, one of these um, uh, thermal shift assays, um, like a uh, super orange or something, except for membrane proteins, more hydrophobic melamide dye, then when it forms a conjugation of free hydro group, it um, becomes fluorescence. Um, so we can just look at increased fluorescence over time as a readout of stability. And so, you know, just to bear in mind all the, the targets we're looking at were modest burst, we could crystallize them, they had multiple cysteines in, in TM segments. Uh, and the idea was um, just to see how stable these things were um, in a sort of a, system, a systematic way of what we could sort of handle at the time, as well as trying to get our own structures. Uh, and so this, th this was actually quite useful as we decided, I, I decided to get a couple of master students um, to work on um, control proteins. So we ended up going back and crystallizing proteins, the structures already known, and, you know, at the time, oh, do we need this control? But I think it was very informative for us to understand, to compare to our own samples, what we needed here. And so we did that. Um, and then we, we measured unfolding rates uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, that's what better for us because we, at the time we didn't have a great um, RT-PCR machine. So we ended up just heating at one temperature, looking at unfolding over a given time period. And then from that, we could from basically uh, from the exponential decay, we could look at the relative unfolding rate of our protein in, in different detergents, essentially. Um, and so when we did that, we found that, as you, you know, I might expect, is that the bacterial proteins, obviously a little bit more of those we could crystallize, the more stable is mild, and there's large micelle detergents. And as the detergent micelle gets smaller, the average stability becomes, becomes obviously worse. It unfolds more quickly. The eukaryotic proteins, we didn't see the same trend. I can tell you why. Essentially, they're on the limit being stable enough already. So, you know, those that we could produce and get some crystals for, you know, they're just stable enough in DDM already. So we're actually not seeing that trend uh, because we're already on that sort of limit stability. This is just a, a something like, you know, I did and, um, um, you know, it's obviously a small data set, but I was just curious. So I looked at the, the calculated myocell sizes by light scattering and plotted against the average half-life we measure. And we see a fairly good correlation. I mean, I'm sure if you add more data sets, it's not going to be this good, but, you know, it, it seems that, you know, generally the size of the mice cell rather than the hair group suggests to be a more dominant factor in terms of driving instability in the protein. Um, and so of course what we want to do is look at these half-lives that we're monitoring and compare them to the monospersity of our sample. And, 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 and so one of the things that we found, uh, for example, and this is what we did, so we took the, the stability, the green is a harsh detergent LDO, DDM is a mild detergent DDM. And basically uh, what we could very much clearly see is if this, if a protein you're working on is gonna look good in DDM, it's gonna look good in look LDO, which is a very harsh detergent. And you superimpose the two F set traces. If they look the same, you're good to go. It's a very stable target. Um, and this, this will quite very nicely, if you go around and purify the protein and then calculate its unfolding rates and half-life. So if you wanted to screen, hey, you could just screen in LDO, but remember to do the comparison to something like DDM. It's always difficult when you just look at one detergent. Um, and then, you know, we could, we could basically, it was very clear that the structures that had gone to high resolution, so my cell detergents, these were these gray guys, our control proteins, they were definitely coming up the, the most stable in our data set. Um, and then a few others were obviously were instances of the structures fill, which is obviously good for us. And over time, we've actually could focus on these few of them, uh, we actually managed to determine their structures. So it, it, it turned out to be very useful, uh, although it didn't have a work on these glucose transporters, 
which were obviously, you know, and a lot of eukaryotic proteins, which are the black guys, uh, which have still, of course, still unstable. It hasn't solved our problem. It's just said, you know, if you want to screen enough and you were looking for natural homologs, you could do that in bacteria and you could probably get away with something you, that is useful. But for the eukaryotic proteins, there's an interest that we haven't really found those targets still. Um, and so, so one of the things that, that we did was to say, well, okay, let's just go back and keep screening. Um, and um, we, rather than the homolog from rat for GLUT5, we, we then found um, um, you know, a different, different version of one from bison, actually, I think it was, that doesn't express so well, but the ethic trace in the house detergent was looking pretty good, was as good as the rat one. So it was like, oh, okay, at least there's something, most of them were worse. Um, this, and uh, in fact, um, that actually worked really well. And this is, uh, you know, um, still you need the hands. This was Gregory Vadon, who had actually just come, uh, took this, and, and with actually with, within a half a year, we actually got a structure um, uh, for, for GLUT5 um, in, in, in using now focusing on the home log that was slightly more stable. Um, the other structure we obtained was actually a collaboration with SOS Lab in Japan at that time. It was what I'd crystallized, but we never got to work well. But of course, they could they raised antibodies against it. It was actually a FE fragment uh, that managed to co-crystallize. And we were lucky that both were a different confirmation. And then, you know, it's, it's allowed us to help interpret how we, you know, that the, the uh, confirmational changes uh, undergone uh, for glucose transport. Of course, they are from different species, right? So, you know, there's always the caveat there, they're not quite the same protein. And for, for the MFS transporters, I don't think we have a single transport in all different conformations. Um, so that's a, obviously that's a caveat there, but this is actually a very well conserved structural fold. So in, in, in comparison to other family members, it's maybe it's a little bit easier to, to, to do these structural comparisons. Um, and another protein um, that we worked on, excuse me, just, checking my time here, um, was um, from the male parasite. So we got these structures and Ying Yang had published uh, other structures of glutes. Um, and I think SGC, and I think, I'm not sure if Fiona published his at that time, but in any case, there were a few glutes. So I said, Let, let's work on something that's a bit distant um, um, for, for, for a number of reasons uh, in terms of, the, actually this guy can transport many different sugars very effectively. I'm quite interested in how I could do that. Um, compared to our more specialized glute transporters. Um, so, so we did that. Um, one issue we had is that it, we couldn't synthesize the genes. So it had to be codon optimized. We prefer not to codon optimize um, because in, actually in the cases we have tested, it's actually been worse. And I, I would say it's probably about four years ago since I tested the last uh, latest algorithms. Um, and we can talk about that later, um, but I, I think it, you know, just remember that membrane proteins fold code translation, the mRNA structure is important. They have natural pore sites. Um, so, you know, obviously current optimization depends on how good the algorithm is to, to optimize it. Of course, it's just not the frequency of the codons, which are the issue here. Uh, you know, this, this, the, um, lots of different factors. One of the factors is important is initiation. So you want an mRNA structure that's uh, a little bit, uh, we say, un unstructured in the beginning. Uh, you know, it's, it, um, it's um, and so, and people found this to be important. So we ended up, what we did here is, because we had kind of an optimizer, it was actually expressed quite poorly in yeast. So we ended up replacing the first five amino acids with those from the glute transporter, glute five, which we knew expressed well, and that improved the expression about uh, threefold or so. Uh, and, and that's ended up the construct we used. It wasn't, the internus is not so conserved. So I think it was a fairly, um, you know, minor thing to do. Um, and this was for it to work in, 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 in Saccharomyces. It was uh, well behaved. Uh, and then typically, right, and the same sort of thing, you get some optimization over time, it was this DDM plus some other short chain detergent. Um, I, I can't, if we use HTG or, uh, uh, we, it's one of those um, yeah, detergents that we sort of add, add um, you know, um, mul you know, um, you have to combine uh, multiple crystals. So, you know, um, 
not, not the you know not the best not the easiest data set uh, difficult to refine but you know it surprisingly gave a very good um, um, signal for the for the bound sugar uh, even its resolution uh, it was a very nice signal mip map and allowed us to build the structure and um, we mapped the coordination of the sugar based on where it had been in homologous uh, structures and, and I think that's a very uh, logical because the binding site is so conserved. Um, so the take home message there was um, that we could use Saccharomyces. We might pay with it in this case the sequence because it was poorly expressed. Um, um, but you know we could sort of follow the same steps we did for the glute transporters, and it actually didn't take us as long of like to optimize uh, this protein uh, for structural work. Um, but then it comes to the question: um, is you know how, uh, why, if you like, why are uh, these eukaryotic proteins more unstable than the bacterial transporters? And, and it was actually coming up in discussion there. So I was thinking, well, of course, acporins are quite stable. But why? Uh, and um, you know, I, and I, I think I'm, I'm, that the role of lipids is very important uh, in terms of, you know, if the proteins evolved to need specific lipid interactions. Uh, and so this was the idea we're thinking about. And one of anecdotal evidence for this, I think, is the, of course, the thermostabilized neurotensin receptor, uh, which is so thermostabilized um, that it can be crystallized from E. coli. And I remember Chris, and Chris can correct me, but I mean, remember that the A two ways, the few, there's a few GPCRs we express in all different hosts. We're interested to see are those ones less fussy in terms of the lipids. I'm not sure, but at least you know. Um, It'd be interesting to look at that. I mean, uh, the neutrons and receptor ACE, you know, maybe the idea is that it's it's so thermostable now, it's so thermostabilized that it's it's insensitive to to what lipids it needs to be um, stable. So we it, we looked at lipids, uh, and we're interested in, in if this was a is this is something that was maybe an issue here, uh, and then we so we in this case we use the heat FSEC method. And so basically it's your FSEC, but you're heating up your sample, right? So GFP uh, will start to lose its fluorescence around 76 degrees. So you can't look at the stability of anything that has the melting temperature that is higher than 76 degrees, because obviously you, you lose your reporter now. And so the idea is you just heat up your sample, spin it down and see the change in the peak height as a function of um, temperature. And from that, you can calculate relative melting curve in the detergent you're interested in. Um, so this has been used um, for Eric's lab to look at ligands. We're interested if we could look at lipids. And so we, what we looked at was uh, a certain protein exchanger where uh, we looked at with Carol Robinson's group, native mass spectrometry, and knew that this guy liked to bind, this one liked to bind catalipin, whereas this other homologue didn't. And so we could, we could detect that. It was a very nice thermostabilization by the catalipin uh, for NHA. Um, and then, you know, just because just adding lipids could give general stability. Um, so these lipids that are thermostabilized in detergent, and then we add them. So this is the control. It's just detergent added, detergent plus lipid added. Uh, if you add like PG, so in this case, it was really clearly with catalipin, it was clearly lipid added rather than PG. PE gives the same. Uh, um, I'm, it doesn't give any clear stabilization either. Uh, in this case, if we make a monomeric mutant, so the idea was that it, it the catalipin bound between the dimers, and we made a monomeric mutant, we saw that we indeed uh, abolished uh, the binding for catalipin. Um, and so, so then what you can do then is, of course, you can do a titration of catalipin, add, add increasing concentration of lipid, and then look at the change in thermostabilization. And so you get this. Um, the sort of sigmoidal binding, if you like, so just cooperative binding of the lipids to so several multiple lipid binding sites. And then we can look at um, what, you know, what these samples look like by FSEC at sort of, uh, sort of slight lower amounts of catalipin, high amounts of catalipin, and see at this concentration of catalipin, the protein, once it's heated, is, you know, it's a little bit quite unstable here. You've got a bit of a dimer form, and, but then you go to this monomeric form here. Uh, whereas it, it based on what we know where the monomer is based on the monomeric mutant in this blue trace here. But just to add a little extra catalipin here where it's more than stable, we could see that predominantly the protein was more stable and probably migrating as a dimer. 
So we could really say that in this using this assay, uh, that the carlipin was thermostabilizing the protein, the thermostabilized was thermostabilizing the dimeric form of the protein. And indeed, there's a the 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 dimerization interface has a lot of positive charges. We had we actually had a structure with DDM and two sulfur anions, but you could model carbolip in that case. Uh, and if you actually subsequently we mutated the arginine residues interface, and we could now abolish the carbolip and binding. Um, so the point there was that um, we were you know could use this assay to look at lipid binding, and lipids are important for thermostabilization, of course. In this case, biologically, it's quite interesting because uh, Etana's group has shown if you actually look at deletion strain from E. coli, NHA is monomeric and non-functional. Um, so we think it's, in this case, to the regulatory mechanism uh, because uh, under salt stress, E. coli cells increase the carlipin content and this transport is required for salt stress. Um, and indeed, evolutionary, um, these two proteins I talked about, this was dependent, this wasn't dependent on carlipin, this was, they look the same, but they evolved a different dimerization interface. Uh, and so um, this is what Carol was also looking at. And, and so sort of, if you like, popular, it was sort of, you know, sort of the idea, if you like, that interfaces that were weaker become more dependent on, on lipids for organization. And that might be some way to regulate activity through organization, whereas uh, interfaces that were more protein mediated were less lipid sensitive. Um, so you could think of some sort of scale here for that. Um, so um, getting back to sort of the, the what that meant in terms of um, structural uh, work, um, uh, we're also looking at uh, in terms of a of a of a mammalian soda protein exchanger. Um, just to point out, uh, uh, if you, in this case, not for crystallization, uh, where well, we tried to crystallize, but it didn't crystallize. Um, um, in this case, we expressed in yeast. Uh, we screened out triton homologs. The one worked on ended up working was from horse. We said we like to use a twin, twin strip tag on the GFP. Actually, sometimes we have a twin strip and a his tag. Um, and the we, this the version that worked actually is a slight truncation here. And maybe interesting for some of you, you can even get a protein migrating at 30 kilodaltons. Uh, but you know, mass spectrometry confirms that's still our protein even though it's monomeric size is around uh, 70 kilodalton. So uh, they can, you know, as you know, they can run strange on SDS gels. Um, of course, this one, uh, you know, was, was with screen. So the idea with screen for um, stability as something we might do for crystallization. Um, and that was good enough um, in, in detergent. In this case, element G, we switched from DDM because of the difference, of course, in the CMC between element G and DDM. Uh, and this was, this was good enough for us to, to, you know, to get a structure. Um, if we kept this large CTL domain, which, which um, sorry, if we kept large CTL domain, which um, we actually couldn't model in the end, which was site disorder anyway, um, you know, the resolution was, was worse and less particles could be added to the final 3D construction. Whereas the, the truncated version, which is obviously more thermostable, more particles could be added. And of course, it, 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 we could have a better map. Um, and I'm just gonna skip these details, but the, the bit that I wanted to sort of mention here is again, we had an idea that lipids could be metering um, organization here. And with Carol's lab, um, she could look at um, the lipids by native mass spectrometry, um, but then you get these peaks and you don't know what those peaks are. The, the peaks were large peaks, which would be consistent with something like PIP2, but we really, you know, it, it didn't confirm the lipids. Um, so then we could um, screen the common lipids with this thermal, uh, thermal uh, shift assay, and we could pick up the specific thermostabilization with, with these PIP2 lipids. And then we could validate this by looking at delta TM shift. And we can see that we get clear thermostabilization with PIP2 versus other lipids. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we can an idea of where the lipids might be binding was this loop here uh, that had a number of lysine residues. Uh, again, we could, we could make a triple lysine mutant, which now by native mass spectrometry um, flies to the monomer uh, rather than, and the, all the monomers that were coming out didn't come with lipids. Uh, and if we, we use that thermal shift assay, we could see that the mutant indeed abolished our binding. So we could use combination by native mass spectrometry and a thermal shift um, to sort of, um, sort of start to characterize these lipid interactions. 
Um, and then that allows us to sort of think of a model here where the lipid, this lipid interface is naturally, um, if you like, uh, less stable and the lipids requiring to stabilize the interface by these proteins, which are working by an elevator mechanism where you might need some scap scum to make a scaffold. So just in the last few minutes, what we've done is then seeing if we can um, get away from having to do the sex step. So what, one of the advantages, of course, with the CPM assay, it's, it's, it's relatively high throughput. There's a lot of thermal shift assays. Um, and, but the disadvantage, the disadvantage, of course, when you purify protein, the advantage of FSEC, the heat FSEC, of course, is you, you don't need purified protein, but it's a bit more time consuming. And so the idea was, can we get this in, into a, a sort of a format that's a bit quicker? Um, and so what we what we found out, end up doing is if we heat our sample in DDM, but then add OG to the sample once uh, before heating in DDM, we can push those aggregates to precipitate so we can spin them down. Um, so the OG will, uh, I mean, it will destabilize the protein, but also mean that we can look at um, the thermal stability uh, in, in, a, in a, without having to do side scooting chromatography. So this is just the, the same sample here. This is looking at the fluorescence and supernatant. And if we resuspend the palette, of course, we see the opposite correlation up to a point at which GFP loses its fluorescence. Um, and so we took the same control proteins I showed you earlier with where it crystallized. We took them again and we compared their, their melting temperatures or well, heat, heat FSEC versus which we now call GF, GFPTS. And we're giving the same correlation. And in fact, they gave the same correlation in terms of their half-lives we'd also measured um, with purified material. So in a way, you know, the, the, un, the unfolding rates we could see from deterred stabilized membranes were consistent with unfolding rates from purified proteins in different assay. Um, so this is essentially it. We have a fusion in membranes or purified fusion. We heat it up, uh, we add OG and we, we spin down. Uh, and then from the thermal shift, we can try to obviously look um, for stabilization from a ligand. Um, and so one of the things that was interesting for us is when we did that for data set, we found that, you know, um, the eukaryotic proteins were, there were number, of course, these are small numbers, but it's sort of interesting that the median stability wasn't that far off the bacterial proteins. Uh, but after purification, the eukaryotic proteins just become far more unstable, which is what we, everyone's experienced. But before purification, they weren't too bad. Whereas the bacterial proteins, they didn't seem to change too much in terms of their stability. So in other words, uh, and it, you know, this was the same trend we'd get for comparing two proteins with essentially the same fold. Uh, this guy was behaving like an average protein data set, and this was, guy was also an average protein set. And so the, essentially the idea is that the eukaryotic proteins, which is anecdotally, essentially evolved uh, to recognize certain lipids. And so when we go about purification, remove those lipids with detergent, they become more unstable, whereas the bacterial proteins are less lipid sensitive. Um, and of course, that means that you can then use this to screen for stabilizing lipids. Some lipids can actually be destabilizing, interesting. Uh, of course, you can screen lipids, crude lipids, or, or of course, uh, cholesterol hemisuccinate, which to be honest, tends to be, you know, more generally the most stabilizing lipid anyway, but at least it gives you an idea of understanding lipid preferences of the protein um, there. So in the last um, uh, minute, I realize I'm, I'm sort of losing time here. Um, of course, you can use the same assay to look at uh, potential substrates. And this was a protein we're trying to characterize um, with for cmp salic acid. And this is the human version versus the, uh, the version from plant. And it gave the same um, thermal profiles when we, when we add different potential substrates. Um, and then we could also calculate the binding affinities and compare those to IDC. Um, so actually the affinities for both the human and the plant one uh, gave the same binding affinity uh, as ITC, but you know this stuff has been measured from um, detergent stabilized membranes, right? Um, and so, in fact, ITC was not able to measure cmp salic acid binding, but we could with this assay um, because it was, you know, this this uh, binds with too low affinity to picked up by ITC. Um, uh, one of the things we've also found is um, adding monoline, uh, which is quickly lipid cubase crystallization. I'm out of time, I'm going to very quickly here. Um, and of course, we can't assay because stations we use for lipid phase, but treating it like any lipid, um, assuming the be free mole only in the LCP crystallization condition, can see it was actually quite destabilizing. But by adding the ligand 
that we know stabilize the protein, could restabilize the protein, this able to come the structure of this protein. Uh, and then later on, once we've got the structure, of course, then you can use the same assay to look at the effect of all these point mutations, but without having to purify all these proteins through the binding assay for either the plant or the human one. Um, so I'm just going to, um, we did this for a different transporter, uh, NHA, uh, we, same sort of idea. We're looking at the effect lipids to stabilize the protein that enables it to the structure of the LCP. And now um, we've recently put this into a 96 well format. Um, so, you know, this is an idea as you have this is a small nucle nucleotide library. Uh, and then if you can pick up uh, the, the control substrate versus a very similar non substrate versus all the other nucleotides. Uh, and so the idea is to now use things like green lantern, more fluorescent GFPs to try to get into a 38 well format for small molecule screening. Uh, and for those interested, we have a, a recipe paper coming out uh, where we can show having GPTS for lipid interactions, ligand interactions from purified material, but also stuff in, in unpurified and membranes. Um, very lastly, we, for those that don't work in, in yeast, um, uh, we go to hex cells, and that's mainly for chromo at the moment due to cost, and that's transient transfections in hex cells. Uh, I don't think we do anything special. Um, we're using cleavable GFP twin strip tag, and uh, for us, it's just a question of cost. Anything that looks okay-ish in monospers and saccharomyces is always going to look slightly better in hex cells. Um, so for us, that's still our initial platform is yeast. We're still screening yeast, you know, there's and yeast, and those where we need to go to will go into hex cells. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and i sorry I don't have time for acknowledgements, and so I'm slightly going over time. Um, thank you. Thank you, David, for a very good, exciting, and informative talk. Uh, we have a few, uh, quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, let's take a couple of them and uh, then whatever hasn't been answered, we'll come back to in the general discussion at the end, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, so uh, we have a question about um, seeing a uh, higher molecular weight band for a purified group one protein. Uh, it's 68 kilodalton, 68 kilodalton specific band. Uh, whether what that could come. Ah, there is there is some yeah. So in the yeast, there's you do get a non fluorescent can you get a a fluorescent contaminant around there. Um, I don't know. It might be a flavor containing protein or something. It's actually quite useful because you, if you compare not to samples, you can use it to make maybe sure that you're loading the same amount on the sample. But uh, yeah, there is a, there is a. Okay, so you don't think it's glut one? It's uh, because this is purified. It's a, uh, oh, sorry, it's a purified one? No, I don't yeah, know. it's a purified protein. Yeah, I oh. mean, I, you know, looking at bands on gels, as you know, <laughs> yeah, they, you sometimes get higher methylate species. Of course, the unfolded form will run, I mean, run more to its, its correct methylate. It's still a little bit high for GLUT1. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, yeah, can't remember. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't pay too much attention to, no. I mean, it's just bands, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit the same. I also found that they often appear to be smaller than they are. Yeah, I mean, they often migrate faster. Yeah, they so. might obviously migrate faster. But, you know, the, I mean, for NH9, I mean, it was, it was around, I said, 30 kilodalton. That was a bit too fast. I was a bit worried, but no, it was definitely a protein. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so uh, one more. We'll take one more question now and then we'll leave the rest. Um, so, Julie wonders how important the protein stability in small mice and detergents is for cryo EM studies compared ah, to crystallization. I, you know, um, so I mean, I won't, yeah, very important, I think. I mean, essentially, I mean, obviously, it's the alignment issue, right? And so the question is how much is alignment issue and how much is conformational stability? Mm -hmm. um, um, so, you know, I, I I can say anecdotally in our lab, the, the samples that have gone the best for cryo are the ones who would optimize for structural work for mm -hmm. crystallization, right? So the stuff with have from hex cells, even though the 2D classes, they still look okay. We haven't quite managed to get good 3D reconstructions. Whereas the stuff we've been able to express in yeast, a little bit more stable, has definitely worked for us. Um, so, you know, and it, I, I suspect you know, obviously, if in confirmation is stabilized by antibody, of course, then you have something that's going to aid in alignment and also, of course, you know, stabilize your protein that's going to make sense for a small membrane protein. Um, but I, I'm sure, right, the same sort of thing. If you've got something that's more, that's more stable, it's more homogeneous, uh, there's more of one class, 
it's it's probably going to you know go much better for Corey and okay. uh, you know even assuming you don't have the alignment uh, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you.